you might remember this picture from a few weeks ago where uh, it's the same woman, but in the first one on the left, she's fractured, and then she's hiding, and then this is what she looks like in God's eyes. And I hope we can all relate to this in one way or another because the thing about life is you could be flourishing in multiple areas, but you could have arrested development in another area. And you could pray and have faith for other people to get healed, but when it, when it comes to you, there's all kinds of formulas that kick in. You say, no, I don't deserve it. I'm not worth it. I've done it before. And like that picture I had during worship, it's like I'm, the woman was pregnant, but she stopped pushing because shame covered her and said, you're not worth it. Don't do it. And that's a lie from the pit of hell, right? Every one of us here is a son and daughter of the living God. When you accepted Jesus, he put his spirit in you and the truth of his word in you, and that's all you need to understand. You then press in and you push for it, but the left two pictures, at least my left, I guess, yeah, your left, um, are not God's purpose for us in our plan. He doesn't need us to hide because we're ashamed. He doesn't need us fractured, but a lot of times we went to the world instead of going to God before we knew him, and, and that caused a fracturing in our lives. But he's better than Humpty Dumpty putting everything back together again. He makes us stronger when we come to him and he heals us because we're free from the, the bondage and the baggage that we were carrying before we knew him. And this culture is really big on follow the winner. Who's got the most likes? Who's got the most followers on whatever platform is out there? And God is saying, no. Listen, he gave talents to the different people. You remember? He gave two he gave four, he gave five. And he said, use this, trade with it until I come back. And the one who had two, what did he do? Buried it. And then the others doubled it, right? And he wasn't upset. He didn't, he didn't hold the one that had more talents in higher esteem. He only was upset by somebody who hid the talent. That's what shame does. And look, there's a clock ticking on our lives, so what are you waiting for, <laughs> right? Every day that goes by could be another lost opportunity. And I could tell you, the devil does not like us talking about this. And he doesn't like talking about the blood of Jesus because when he hears that in the deliverance room, he, he's hijacked out because nothing is more powerful than the blood that, that forgave you. When you said yes to the Lord, it's not that you didn't do terrible things, of course, and you certainly still can make mistakes as a Christian. The difference is you've got his presence in your life now. And before I was saved, my conscience was seared with a hot iron, to use the scriptural language of it. It was the goal that I was shooting for was not to be more like Jesus. It was to get the acceptance of the people around me that I admired. Well, you should take out a pen at one point and write down a list of all the people whose opinion matters to you and fold it up and put it in your wallet. And if somebody tries to shame you, pull out that list and say, you're not on this list. Sorry, you can't shame me because you're not on the list of people that I'm concerned about what they think about me. You know, we're on, we have a big online presence and all, and people will make very, very critical statements and say that they're Christians. And I pull out that list. I say, nope, you're not on the list. Sorry. I still might be able to learn from the criticism. I want to be open to what they're saying, that there could be some truth in it. I could have a blind spot just like anybody else. But the difference is the, the girl on the right here, the real person, it's not that she's perfect. She's just not hiding anymore. And once you stop hiding, you can be intimate with the Lord in a much easier way. You're not apologizing for the mistakes you made because he says as far as the east is from the west. That's how far I've removed your transgressions from you. So Jane Hammond was speaking recently. She said, we don't even need the devil to accuse us because we have such a loud voice. We accuse ourselves. And I want to break that off today. That's what I'm praying for, that we have time of prayer at the altar for anybody who's feeling shame and feels like they're a little overwhelmed by any of this. Why leave with that? Leave without it. Leave it at the altar and don't take it home with you. So the text verse I use is from 1 John 4, 8. Delivered from the torment of shame. And, and I said it's, it's relentless torment of shame. But I just want you to think about that because that's the enemy's weapon. He has no authority over you. And the only power he has is to lie. So how do you cancel lies? I'll try to keep the questions easy for you. 
<laughs> you cancel lies with the truth. And this says there's no fear in love. That's the truth. Perfect love casts out fear. How many have received the perfect love of the Lord? Yeah, we know it up here, but we don't always receive it fully in our hearts because we haven't forgiven ourselves, even though he forgave us. Or we might still have people speaking into us that are speaking curses over us because they're jealous or because they don't like us or because they haven't forgiven us. And check if they're on the list in your wallet. Like, is this somebody that I should be concerned about? Many times it's not. But fear involves torment. That's the opposite of love. Perfect love casts out fear. There's no fear in love because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. And I love this one too also in 1 John, and I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, nobody talks more about truth and love than John. When you look it up and you do a word study, I mean, he has great insight, and I have come back to this one so many times. If our heart condemns us, can anybody relate to a time in your life when your heart condemned you? I'm waiting. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, if not, that's awesome. I hope it's true, but you're, you're very much the exception to the rule. So what do we do with condemnation? We know in Romans it says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are okay. So maybe if we're feeling that we're not fully in where he wants us to be, could be an option. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So you want to be in a culture where you trust the people around you and you can be vulnerable to them and they won't use that against you somewhere, right? And that's part of what we've tried to cultivate here for 23 years is that you can be honest and safe and nobody's going to talk about your business because we all have stuff. And nobody here hasn't made major mistakes, whether we admit it or not, it's another story. But why stay there when God wants to heal us? So I just, I just gave a couple of prayers. This is a picture on the left of the prodigal son coming back to the father, and the father's covering him. And that's a really important picture for all of us, to understand the covering love of our father. And if you didn't have an earthly father who did that for you, Forgive that, Father, because they probably were doing the best they could and they just didn't know what to do. And what's your other option besides forgiving them? Holding them in some prison of hatred that you can't forgive them. That's not God. That's the devil. He loves company. And if he's got to be a bitter orphan, he wants you to be a bitter orphan. No. I have a spirit of adoption. I cry out, Abba, Father, you're a good, good father. Wow. That's such a better thing. So, Father, cleanse me from the defiling torment of shame. Stop the accuser of the brethren from having place in my mind to remind me of all the mistakes I've made. I'm not denying that I made them, but I'm not living there anymore. I'm being transformed into your image so that I don't have to live that way anymore. And then I repent and break agreement with the lies that I've believed about myself. If you had an authority figure speaking junk over you as a child, you're stupid. You're never going to amount to anything. You wouldn't believe what some people say. But again, you can hold them in prison or you can forgive them because they were more hurting than you even realized. Because hurt people, thank you, Nate, a little louder. Hurt people, yeah. So we don't want to keep repeating that same process, do we? We want to be an agent of change. We want to be kingdom operators, emissaries, ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We all know how to hold a grudge, but it's not so easy to forgive people who've hurt you, is it? So I repent, Lord, and I break agreement whenever I believe something about myself that doesn't agree with what you think about me. And the way you know that is here. You metabolize the word of God into your heart. You cancel lies with the truth. You don't put any deposit in you can't make any withdrawals, right? And then the last one, forgive me and empower me, because that's another great word that the Lord does. Grace, he gives you power above and beyond your natural ability. You've heard people say, I don't know how you made it through that period, and the Lord will say, he gave me the grace to get through it. Everybody experienced that at one point or another? It wasn't your natural ability. So this is a, a power source beyond our own ability. Lord, I need you as I forgive and receive your forgiveness to empower me by this word and your spirit that's in me to receive your unconditional love. Not just 
any random love, but a father's love. What has come under more attack in our culture than the office of the father? It's really been like 60, 70 years. It just started a long time ago. And now it just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying to take down the office of the father. And that's demonic. He created them male and female. Be fruitful and multiply. A man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Fundamental, created in his image, and yet attack it, attack it, attack it. Now, things that are strong not only resist the attack, but get stronger through the attack. You know that if you've ever tried to defend your faith, the more you defend it, the more you use those muscles, the more you believe what you're saying to people. And if you never witness, then the questions come up and you're wondering, what should I say? But no, because of the way we're built, we're not just resilient. We get stronger when we get pushed because he's inside of us. He got stronger as he was pushed. He got all the way to the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Man, that, that Roman soldier there at the foot of the cross said, surely this was the Son of God. Maybe you know this or not, but on the Roman coins, Caesar was called the Son of God. So this Roman soldier's like, no, it ain't Caesar. This is the real deal. If anybody had a right to be cursing somebody out their mouth, instead he's forgiving the guy on the cross next to him and forgiving the people that are killing him. He's the ultimate Example of the human that we want to follow, empowered by his spirit in us and filled with the word, who he is, the word. Made flesh, dwelt among us. You all know that one. Let's look at some examples of people who were faced with shame in scripture. I'm not going to do a long teaching today, but Leah is one that I've always had a sympathy for, right? Because there was all kinds of trickery going on. And she, it says here in, in Genesis 29, 17, Leah's eyes were weak which probably interprets that maybe it looked like she was cross-eyed, which would mean that, you know, she didn't have the most beautiful appearance. But her sister, Rachel, was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. And when, when you're Leah in that point, you know that he loves your sister more than he loves you, so you feel shame. And in our culture today, that seems to be very acceptable to shame people based on whatever virtue signaling that you want to send out. You know, anybody know what I mean by virtue signaling? People who, who say that they believe one thing, but it's only because they want to put you down. They feel better about themselves by putting you down. They didn't move, but by criticizing you, they feel like they're higher up than you. Not how it works in the kingdom, amen? Not how it works in the kingdom. So Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and it was very obvious to Leah, even though she married him. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her womb. All right? And then I won't go in too far into that story. I doubt there's anybody in here that hasn't been rejected in your life. I really doubt it. And you feel shame over whatever the thing is. You're trying to work. Uh, you, you go to the tryout for a sports team, and you don't make the team. You're trying uh, as in, in an orchestra, in a band, and you didn't make the cut. Whatever it is. There's two ways you can look at it. I quit, I give up, I'm a loser. Or you know what, I'm going to try to learn from that situation. And I'm going to, if I first don't succeed, I'm going to try again. Which one do you think Jesus wants us to do? Right. Constantly looking to be transformed into your image, Lord, with ever-increasing glory. And then in Samuel, you probably know the story of Hannah very well. But this is 1 Samuel 1. It says, Hannah's rival, Penaniah, also provoked her severely to make her miserable. Have you ever had someone in your life provoking you severely to make you miserable? And have you been tempted to do a Tanya Harding on them? <laughs> Wait out in the parking lot and jump them. Those are my relatives, but I won't go there. <laughs> I hire my cousin Vinny. <laughs> no, that's not the Lord's way. They're only going to shift if they see something different in you. So that hatred that they're having towards you, it could be because you made a mistake, but it just could be for a multitude of other reasons. What am I going to do with it is what matters. And I'm going to break the shame. And I'm going to say, Lord, help me see myself as you see me. So you're proud of me, even though I'm not flawless. doesn't mean I'm perfect, but I'm moving towards the perfection of your son, Jesus. 
in every decision I make. So <laughs> Hannah, well, I'll tell you what, she was being openly shamed by Penaniah. That's not easy. Did the Lord reward her for her faith? Say yes. We'll come back to that story another time. This is another one. I could only give you one verse here. Jacob loved Joseph more than he did any of the other sons. How'd that work out for Joseph? When you show favoritism to your children, that's not a good plan, is it? Because the other children are going to feel very jealous about that. And I don't even know that it was Joseph's fault, was it? Because there's so many different factors that go into these things. It didn't help that he told them about the dream where they were going to all bow down to him. Maybe he needed a little more discernment on that one. <laughs> they ended up all bowing down to him someday, just saying. <laughs> Favoritism is not good. It brings shame. It brings shame to the other children. And I'll tell you what, it could even go as down to you have three children and they get their report cards at the same time and only the ones that get the A's get to go out and have ice cream. Woo! Right? Like, what does that do to the B's and the C's? I'm cheating, man. I'm going to get that A no matter what. Don't do that. Here's the thing. Just, are they trying their best? Are they giving it their best? We're not all the same on that front, right? And how much time are you sowing into your children? How, what are you investing to help them learn and see what they're good at? And then you're going to give them tutti frutti if they get the A. That's a bad way to bribe your kids. Throwing that in there for free. <laughs> and then this character in the Bible is worth looking at, Mephibosheth. He was the grandson of King Saul, who doesn't rank very highly in the, in the list of kings. He, he failed to follow the Lord and, and went, actually went to a witch and sought advice from a witch. Clearly, bad idea. So over and over again, the people asked for a king, and he just... He wasn't God's choice. He, he was the people's choice. And even there, he was still God's anointed. Even in, in God's authority structure, David said, I won't touch God's anointed, even though he's not acting like it right now. Man. So Mephibosheth, he's not been able to walk since he's five years old. You probably know the story. He was dropped by his nurse who was trying to escape. She dropped him, and he became crippled at five. And then in chapter 9, that was chapter 4, it says, Mephibosheth knelt before David, who was the king, and he said, why should you care about me? I'm worth no more than a dead dog. Can anybody relate? Ever felt that way? Broke up, your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend broke up with you and said terrible things about you. And, and it's like all, all this shame is just pouring down like a shower on you. Well, you know, they might have done you one of the best favors of your life. <laughs> we do counseling here, no charge. <laughs> we had a speaker come in many years ago, and he gave us this great expression. Some of you have heard it. Don't say shame on you. Say shame off you. <laughs> As Christians, we're not supposed to be shaming people, right? That's not the character of Christ. He forgives us because we deserve it. Because we earned it? No, because he loves us. And you could try to use shame on people to motivate them, and it'll work for a while, won't it? It does. It works. You could just keep competing. Just read the story of Jack Frost, who, who came here and spoke many times. His father constantly compared him to his older brother as a tennis player, and finally he just dropped the racket and said, that day, 12 years old, I stopped being my father's son because I couldn't live up to the expectation. No blessing is ever coming. The, the, the bait is always just dangled a little bit out of your reach, and no matter how good you're doing, you never get there. There's no there. Not good. That's not the Lord. The Lord is there to encourage us and say, this is a good level you're at, but you can go higher. And let's look at some of the things you're doing. That's what he does. He's a loving father. So distinction in guilt, between guilt and shame is guilt says what you did is bad. Shame says you are bad. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> so don't say to your children that they're bad. What they did was bad and wrong, but they're not bad. Big difference, isn't it? Anybody need to repent right now? 
<laughs> so I know this is not like a hallelujah, amen, but I'm getting to the good news in a little while here. Hang in there. <laughs> and I just, you know, kind of use creat creativity a little to think about what Jesus says about us is that, yes, you do fall short, but it's right built into, the, into your nature that you inherited when you were born. There's no way around sin in your nature because you were born with it. So there's a shaming sin nature built right into us because of what Adam and Eve did. What's the answer? Get a new nature and, and not Hare Krishna. All right? No, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, Word of God, other Christians and not milk drinking Christians, meat eating Christians because we have to hold each other accountable to a high standard and not water down the Word. Got an amen there. That's good. Your nature, Jesus would say to us, yes, you have this factory-installed shame, sin nature, but your nature can be transformed. And again, I'll just kind of combine it. If you take the chaff and burn off the chaff and just keep working on the wheat, and there's always some chaff that can be burned off in our lives. Do you ever notice that you read the Bible and you get new revelation after you've already read the same thing? Do you ever wonder what that's about? It's the same book, but it's alive and it's powerful. And as you're reading Scripture, the book doesn't change. You change. And because you're getting more and more revelation, you're burning off more and more chaff. The things that used to be important aren't so important to you anymore. And now you read it through the lens of a meat eater. And when you, know, when you first get saved, you, you don't even realize you're dropping F-bombs half the time. Thank you, Nate. Because you got so used to it, you didn't even know you were doing it. So somebody has to love you enough to say, hey, you know, uh, did your mom ever wash your mouth out with a bar of soap? <laughs> well, we're Christians now, so we don't have to drop F-bombs. There's always another way you could say something and still make the same point. Because you didn't even know it was wrong. Music that you listen to, the more you read it, it's not condemnation. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit in us that balances out. doesn't mean to shame us. But when it hit me, I took, I took boxes full of Grateful Dead albums to the back of the garbage truck, and I made sure that I, hand, you know, I worked that handle so they all got crushed. I wasn't going to give them to somebody else. What a long, strange trip it's been. That was one of the signs. Man, LSD trip. Nobody needs to hear that one. Okay. So what about Peter? He was ashamed. Why? Yeah, right? That would be a reason to be ashamed, wouldn't it? But Jesus forgave him, didn't he? How about he repented and he received forgiveness? And you would say he flourished. And you read the book of Acts, the same guy that denied Jesus three times was redeemed. Not Shawshank, man. This is much better redemption. This is a guy who was willing to be hung upside down, according to church history, because he didn't want to be crucified the same way Jesus was. Talk about a conviction and a change of character and a transformation of your personality and who you are. Your whole identity becomes tied in with courage after you were weak and didn't want to defend him. And Jesus even said before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Oh, no, I'll die for you. Can you relate? Can we just be honest? We all think we would be Schindler, but we end up going along with the program and looking the other way. Not to that degree, I'm just saying, be careful that you don't forget that there is a sin nature in us. We're saved, but if we're not sanctified and transformed and growing, we can easily shift back to that old way of thinking. And Judas is another good example, though, right? He betrayed Jesus, the worst betrayal. Dante puts Judas right in the lowest rung of hell when he did the inferno. And I can understand why. He betrayed Jesus, and the relentless torment of shame convinced him to take his own life, right? Is suicide up or down in our culture? I mean, crazy, crazy. We've never flourished more financially, and more people are taking their lives. There's more medication being taken for anti-depression now than ever. So it clearly isn't the straight line of prosperity that's doing it. It's that inner peace that you need for knowing that you're centered on the rock, that your feet are on the rock of Christ. And I'm going to burn off the chaff. The more he shows me, and I married a prophet, so I get to find out where the chaff is. It's a free gift. And she does it in a very loving way. 37 years we've been married, so something worked. That was a great thing. 
to have somebody in your life that you trust that points things out to you and says, you, you could do better. It's not shaming. It's like, no, you, you were made for more than this. And that's what the church is all supposed to be doing for each other too. And then Paul addresses this too because he talks about two different kinds, guilt and shame, you could argue, is what he's referring to here. He said 2 Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians, he corrected them pretty severely. 2 Corinthians, he writes back and he says, I rejoice not because you were grieved by my last letter, but because you were grieved into repenting. That's a difference. Conviction brings you to a higher level and said, ah, that wasn't my best. I didn't have to do that. Forgive me, Lord. I repent of that. If I have a chance again in a similar situation, I don't want to do that again. I want to operate at a higher level for you. For you felt a godly grief. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. <laughs> it's the Bible. <laughs> it's all good. Even the maps. And leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces Judas hanging himself. Can't forgive himself, can't ask for repentance. And the devil is really having a heyday with people with suicide and depression and all these drugs. Not so for us, Lord. We are your children. Help us forgive ourselves for the mistakes we make. Help us not to speak curses over ourselves with our own mouth. We want to speak life, not death, out of our mouth about ourselves. And then, if you didn't know this verse, this, I'd say highlight this and memorize this in, in, in your Bible. Revelation 12, a loud voice in heaven said, he heard a loud voice, just John. Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. True? Yes, in your life it's come. Not to the full extent that he's seen it in heaven, but when you got saved, the kingdom came inside of you. Salvation, strength, kingdom of God, and the power of his Christ have come. And I want more power, and I want more strength, and I want less of me and more of him. How about you? For the accuser of our brethren named Satan, who has accused them before God day and night, has been cast down. That's a good picture. He hates that verse. The devil hates that verse in Scripture. But it's true. He's been cast down. The only authority he has, not authority, only power he has over you is that you believe the lies he's telling you. And when you get in a right culture, people won't, won't let you believe lies about yourself without pushing back a little bit. Don't say that about yourself. God doesn't say that. You shouldn't say that about yourself either. And they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. And a lot of times you don't hear this last part quoted, but did not love their lives to death. Burning off the chaff is not loving your lives unto death. Recognizing that you've got a habit that may not be an open sin, but it's not taking you closer to Jesus. I'm burning that off. Don't want it. Don't need it in my life. You know this when Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Does anybody believe that he's doing that for you right now? He forever makes intercession He's at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Do you think Satan is wanting to sift you out like wheat? Yeah, but we've got a counterforce much greater than... Satan's not even equal to Gabriel the angel, never mind equal to God. And we elevate him to this high position that he does not deserve because he's a good liar. Jesus says to Peter, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. And then Peter later, very shifted his personality. He says, be sober-minded and watchful for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You guys holding up okay? Can I have a couple more minutes? All right. I won't go too much longer. But I like, thanks, I like this picture in my mind. I work, still do work on Wall Street, but I don't have to go there every day. But how a finance field that I've been in for the last 30 plus years and you're constantly trying to thread a needle of what should I do in this situation. Half the time it's because the people around you are really smart and they came from all over the world and they find mental gymnastics to jump through ethical behavior that's not right. And they'll defend it, but you get to the bottom of it and there's nothing there. It's not true. They just find good ways to cheat. And the whole financial crisis was around this, right? So you don't want to be Joe Know-it-all. 
but you're just asking the Lord, help me today to navigate this needle because wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And I don't want anything, anything other than the best you have for me in every situation. And often they'll press you because they're really good. They know how to get under your skin a little bit and make you look weak if you don't decide. It's like, you know what? I need a night to sleep on this. They accept that saying. You know that you need to go pray in tongues and make sure that you're hearing from the Lord before you commit because they'll bait you into something that you didn't want to do. It doesn't mean that I don't want them to get saved, but I don't want to be unequally yoked with them. Got it? My phone is ringing. I hope it's not my wife calling me. Wide is the road that leads to death. Lots of those options. You're forgiven when you miss that, when you miss that narrow road, but you don't want to miss the narrow road. You go back and try again. So one, one road to destruction is to be fractured by the world, take drugs, fracturing. Oh my God, LSD, fracturing. Or you could just hide because you're ashamed and you're putting up the front and the people who love you don't even feel like they know you because they only know a part of you that, you know, you're only letting them into the hallway of your house, but they never get into the kitchen to sit down and break bread with you because they only want you to know a certain amount. That's not God's best, right? I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just saying, let's aim higher than that. We can forgive each other. And then that's what he wants us to be. The, no mask, no fracturing, healed of the Lord. Not perfect, but think of Acts 13, 22. We flourish when we are what? Chasing after God's own heart. That's what you want to be. A meat eater who's chasing after God's own heart. We all have our own path to get there. But man, there's no better thing you could do with your life than to be transformed into the image of Christ with ever increasing glory. I have more, but I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. It's clear that our flesh entices us into practicing some of the most heinous acts. <laughs> and there's a long list. I'm not giving you the whole list. But drunkenness is on the list, okay? It's not a sin to drink a drink of alcohol, but it is a sin to be drunk. Anybody want to call me a heretic? You all believe that's true, right? How many have been drunk in your life? Oh, you know, we're not going to take your picture, but before you got saved, hopefully, right? Before you got saved. And does God like that? Or no, he calls it a sin. But why does the devil want you to go there? Because you're not in control of yourself. You're like a city with the walls down. You have no protection. So what are, what are we supposed to do? We could be church lady and condemn people for drinking, or we can show them a better way. And look, you know, <laughs> excuse me. the world makes this look really attractive. Okay? Like, on the surface, before you get involved, it's like, oh, my God, she's beautiful. I want to be with her. And then this is what happens. You just crash and burn, and things happen. So much of the sin in my life was when I was intoxicated because I didn't, I didn't have control, and my spirit, man, was not in control. So why would I want to give the devil control now that I am a Christian? But not again, have a glass of wine. It's not a sin, but, like, don't get drunk because you're not in control anymore. And look, here's a little hint. The liquor stores are called unlimited spirits. Spirits unlimited. Big, like, sign. Spirits unlimited. It's a chain. It's a chain. Here's what the Bible says, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Anybody relate? Whoever is deceived by those are not wise, Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Reckless indiscretion. Who put those two words together? Me. If, if there was Facebook when I was a teenager, I'm cooked. Cooked. Thank you, Lord. Nobody took my pictures. Instead of being drunk on wine, be filled with the Spirit. Amen. I'm just going to finish this part right here with this verse because the wording is just so, it just hit me so hard. It said, don't you remember how you used to just exist? You know, when you bought into the devil's plan, there was just, there was no satisfaction. You tried to do things, but it got less and less satisfaction the more you did it. So you had to do more. 
You hear it often with pornography too, with men especially, but it's not just men anymore. It's you look at a certain level of pornography and it just doesn't satisfy anymore, so you have to go to a different level. And it's more and more perverse the deeper it gets, right? Because that's the devil's paycheck. You work for the devil, he pays you with death. Death to relationships, death to the healthy parts of your life. So all of this is just to say, I don't want shame on my life. You shouldn't want it either. You're forgiven, but whatever's causing it to be there, we want it off of us. Amen? We want to break it off of us. So he said, we were like corpses, dead in life. I don't know if you can relate to this. Maybe you weren't as crazy as I was, but I can really relate to that. Corpses, dead to life, buried by transgressions, wandering the course of this perverse world and obeying the impulses that were in me to follow the perverse thoughts that I had. And I was motivated by the wrong power. I was motivated by a dark power. And then I saw the light. Then I got saved. And then I wasn't immediately a mediating Christian by any means, but I was on the track of redemption and transformation. And, you know, there's a sanctification process where you get closer and closer to Jesus. You only want more of him, not less. You want more because I want to be more like him. So I'm going to, I'm going to go fast now and just kind of cut to the end. I didn't know worship was going to go so long. I talked to the pastor and he said it was okay. <laughs> Psalm 103, he has not dealt with us according to our sins. Can we stand? This is so powerful. We should just say it out loud together because this is the word of the Lord. Ready? Psalm 103, verse 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And 14 says, for he knows our frame, that we are dust. All right? Can you just hold your hands out and say, I receive your forgiveness, Lord. I receive your forgiveness over the mistakes I've made in my life. I don't want to curse myself with my words or disagree what you say about me. If you have forgotten those sins, I silence the voice of the enemy right now from having a voice in my spirit that's trying to condemn me because there is therefore now no condemnation. The deeper and deeper I get into Christ, there's less and less condemnation. Yes, conviction but not condemnation. I had a lot of good scriptures for you. <laughs> I'm going to end on this one. I'm putting it down. I'm not lying. We're landing. But I, do, I would like to say, if the, pre, if the altar ministry team could come up and anybody who's on our staff, elders, leaders, and you pray for people, could you come up and face outward? And, and for, the, for anybody who wants to come up, I mean, for me at least, what the burden the Lord put on my heart for today was to break off shame off of people. And it's hard, right? Because it, it loves to hide in the dark. It lives in the dark. And, and the last thing, can I tell you, the last thing is for you to say, I need prayer for shame, and then be too ashamed to come up to the altar for prayer. See what he does? There's no shame in wanting to get free from this thing. Okay, so look, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Hebrews chapter 12, too, right? Anybody know the rest of that verse at the beginning? He goes, for the joy that was set before him. Do you believe that was you? You are the joy that was set before him. Me, in spite of all the mistakes I made, I was the joy that was set before him. And part of it was because anybody that met me afterwards, like, I don't know what happened to you, but... Something's really different, right? So the more dramatic the changes, the more God gets the glory. So nobody's too far away from him. And stop letting shame stop you from being who God called you to be. That's my request, if you need it. If you don't, no worries. But you also want to be able to help other people get free from this pit, the lie from the pit. And I know we normally do teams, but... Well, we could just start by praying for people without having to worry about teams because I don't want to restrict people that, that want to come up for prayer. And you might just want to kneel on the altar. It doesn't, be, it doesn't have to be where somebody is a, 
is praying with you, but we can flow with the Holy Spirit and just say, Lord, break the shame off my life. Break this lie from the pit of hell that I'm never going to amount to anything. I forgive my father for speaking lies over me, for speaking death over me. Whoever that important person was that you looked up to that let you down or however you have beaten yourself up for some kind of sexual discretion that you did. Some people have had abortions and they weren't saved and they they're, they're just so condemn themselves now. But he doesn't hold you accountable for that part of your life. The devil's the one that's accusing you and forcing you to try to keep thinking of that. It's like, no, I'm forgiven. My innocence has been restored. I am cleansed by the blood of the Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. The iniquity in my life is washed away by the blood. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all iniquity and perversion, and bad decisions that I made. So I'm just going to say on the left here, Acts chapter 2, 38 says, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Can you lift your hands? I just want to speak that over you. I'm not going to have some big dramatic altar call here. I'm just saying if you want shame broken off your life in any way, shape, or form, the altars are open. And, and it's always open here. The altars are always going to be open for whatever it is. So, Lord, I thank you for the tribe that you have assembled here in Basking Ridge on this amazing mission property. We want to be missionaries that go out into all the world and take this message, this good news that you've given us, that our past might have been terrible, but our future is amazing because of who we serve and who you are and who's already inside of us. And, Lord, we just break agreement right now. Everybody here breaks agreement with every lie the enemy has spoken over them, that they might see who you see inside of them and then grow into that identity in you, first and foremost as a son and a daughter of the living God. Lord, I pray that cleansing power of your spirit to come over all of us here today, that we would walk in the fullness and the stature and the completion of the character of Christ in our lives in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.